The Sporland Division of Parker Hannifin Corporation is sponsoring this podcast. Sporland is the leading manufacturer of HVAC and R components. Using quality materials and craftsmanship, Sporland maintains a commitment to innovation, manufacturing excellence, service, and support for its customers since 1934. The company is known for its catch-all filter dryers, thermostatic expansion valves, solenoid valves, pressure regulating valves, suction filters, electric valves, controllers, supermarket monitoring solutions, chemicals, smart service tools, ZoomLock Max Press to Connect, and ZoomLock Push, Push to Connect Refrigerant Fittings. If folks want to learn more, what do they do? Uh, you can go to Sporland.com. I guess that's Jim and John for Sporland signing off. We've all been there in the middle of a job, everything going smoothly until boom, you're missing a part. United Refrigeration is your one-stop shop for all your refrigeration needs. Use your computer or smartphone to go to www.uri.com at any time of the day or night to check stock on your favorite brands, such as Copeland, Sporland, Carlisle Compressors, Danfoss, Emerson CPC Boards and Sensors, Corel, Hussman Parts, and k -Therm. United Refrigeration Inc. is home to these brands and many more. Looking for information on refrigerant conversions or refrigerant banking? Quick access links on the homepage can get you to the information you need. All approved accounts are able to see live to the minute inventory and pricing. Product not in stock at your local branch? No problem. Use the nearby stock feature to find a local branch that does have what you need. Are you looking for a branch address, phone number, or after hours number? That's all available as well. Just click on the branch locator and search for your local branch. Have a model number and looking for a replacement part? www.uri.com forward slash ARP has a vast list of quick pick replacement parts. Just search for the model number of the equipment you're working on and click the replacement parts tab. If you don't have an account, click the register button and we'll have you online in no time. With more than 400 locations in North America, each United Refrigeration branch is fully stocked for immediate pickup. Our branch employees have in-depth technical knowledge so we can help you get what you need when you need it. Visit your local store or www.uri.com forward slash ARP today. United Refrigeration Inc. has all your solutions down cold. What's going on, everybody, and welcome to Advanced Refrigeration Podcast. You're with your host, Brett Wetzel and Kevin Compass. Where are you at, buddy? I am at home, thank God, after that terrible, terrible le week last week in Texas. Oh, yeah, you were, you were fucking dead. Yeah, I, uh, I was sick. Nothing worse than being out of town than all of a sudden getting the flu, and then that turning into like a massive sinus infection. That was yeah. terrible. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you didn't invite me out. I'm glad you like blew me off because like I, I just didn't want to get the man flu. Yeah, that was uh, that was not fun. And uh, if anybody's n n ever had vertigo, God, that sucks. <laughs> I told you, man, you got to get your sinuses drilled out for sure. Yeah, it, it will correct all of your issues. I promise you, because I haven't. My my face used to blow up like sloth from the Goonies. And then, like, I would get vertigo, and then my teeth would hurt. And it was so bad that, like, at one point, I, I went to the dentist's office and was like, fix my teeth. He's like, there's nothing wrong. I was like, you sure? Yeah. All right, guys. Today, we're going to go over uh, how to verify and troubleshoot inputs and outputs on case controllers in an efficient, somewhat manageable way. So... Brett, you want to take it since you uh, since you started this whole thing or yeah. goal, your issue? <laughs> I was so I was dealing with a, a case controller uh, today, and you know we were trying to figure out why the pressure transducer was reading oh anywhere from like fifteen to twenty pounds off, and come to find out, um, you know, we were looking at this specific case controller, and it didn't have the option for the pressure transducer that was in there. You can you can adjust the span as far as the pressure rating, but you can't do anything with the voltage. And 
So the problem is here, we had a voltage range set for either zero to 10, um, zero to five, or uh, four to 20 milliamps. And the pressure transducer that we had was uh, 0.5 to 4.5 and 650 range. And so I don't know if this is the right thing to do, but it worked for now. I got to contact the manufacturer and figure out. But I was able to broaden the span, um, making reading from zero to 672. And, you know, kept the range to zero to five because I didn't have any other freaking option. And then was actually able to um, achieve the, uh, the, the, the pressure range that I needed. Because, like I said, it was reading off by 20 pounds. When with CO2, um, that's like, I don't know, five, five or six degrees. So, um, you know, I, I got to reach out to the manufacturer and see if they have a fix for it. But as of right now, it, was, it ended up causing us to have uh, intermittent uh, flooding on a lot of the systems, which was not doing well for the system. It was causing a lot of spikes and a lot, a lot of the rest of the circuits because it was constantly like it was it was it was feeding so much refrigerant in some of these lines that it was um, oh, man, it was uh, it was backing up pressure about 10 15 20 upwards of 25 pounds what 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 not the only problem but i I already know what you're yeah yeah this this particular case controller i just want to smash with a hammer can't smash with a hammer (sighs) we're gonna figure it out Someone, someone actually just just messaged me and said they, they think they have it figured out. That well, you, know, they, think well, you, don't have, you don't have these problems with microthermal. Their <laughs> case controllers work. Hey, Emerson's too. 679, 678. I've never seen that issue. Um, no, I'm not, what? I've seen it on the 678s and 679s, but I think it's like a lag. Well, no, that's what I'm saying. It's it's a it's a lag issue. Like if you have it, well, that that's what I mean. Like if we would turn off the the suction just to let it just to level let let it level out, it was reading exact on there. You know what I mean? Like we were taking a temp or pressure transducer, you know, on a on a, a, a field piece, then we tried to test out, and I was just making sure that the pressures were were off. And you know, I was like, man, maybe your shit's fucked up, you know, because we. I used the interpolator to try to figure it out, and then I I must have messed something up because it wasn't working. It was giving me the same ranges, and then I was like, I need to think about this. So I went down in the back of the machine room and basically started sitting down and you know plugging numbers. I'm like, wait a minute, now it's moving, and it just so coincidentally happened that it was 20 pounds off, and I was like, no shit. So that's when we were, I was trying to play with the interpolator to see what would match up the best as far as the ranges. And like I said, when I put the the pressure transducer range to to six seventy two, like it it was like a half a pound to a pound off, which isn't bad at all, you know. Because like I said, it was causing the uh, electronic pulsing valves to just barrel refrigerant so bad down down the pike. That particular manufacturer, for some god awful reason, says that the minimum valve percentage. It has to be 16%, not zero, because zero is 16 for some god-awful reason. So this particular case controller will be, um, there's a setting in there, basically, so it if it's at superheat set point and still not at temp, it will force the valve to 16% as the minimum. And really? it'll pulse refrigerant. That is why this particular customer is having so many problems with their particular CO2 racks because <laughs> you, you'll you'll catch it. I, I, I blew the charge twice because of this. Well, you know, it was funny because we were um, I was there explaining the rack like that's really what I was there for. And we were upstairs and I'm like, yeah, this, you know, and I, I you know, because usually when I explain the rack, I go around and just you know, go through the main piping. And then I add all the bells and whistles later after, after I know that they got the theory of, of how everything rolls. We usually use the P and I and D diagram because, you know, some of those racks have so many freaking uh, lines going all over the place, like trying to look at it. Sometimes you're like, 
I'm fucking lost. So like, you know, a lot of times going over the, the, the diagram on paper, you know, going through, okay, discharge line goes out, goes over through here, through the oil system, and then up to the, uh, you know, the, the gas cooler and that. And like I said, we, you know, we went through everything and I was pointing over towards the liquid injection. And I was like, yeah, you know, this is feeding. I'm like, whoa, why is that so hot? You know, I couldn't figure out why the, why the freaking, um, you know, the valves on the on the liquid injection were hot. And I was like, well, no, it's obviously not feeding. And, you know, I, I found the I found the program that it was that was feeding the liquid injection and it wasn't calling for anything. The, 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 the suction line superheat was so low, you know, probably because of this issue with the with the pressure transducers, basically, you know, showing that they had, you know, they had seven degrees of superheat. But in all reality, they did not have seven degrees of superheat. It was stupid, stupid low. Yeah, those uh, those racks, the uh, liquid injection never turns off. Or I'm sorry, the hot gas injection just never turns off. Well, no, the, these these racks don't have that liquid injection. Um, they have hot gas I'm, injection. Sorry, I'm sorry, they, they, I'm sorry, they have liquid injection. They don't have hot gas injection. Oh, yeah, those ones have the heat exchangers. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, the, the, the heat exchangers never shut. It just just. It's just always de, de- superheating. Well, it's it's a mix between you know I think the issue that I found today, and you know the the oversizing of certain things, which just leads to really low suction. Oh, the pulse valves that are triple the size or double the size they need to be. M- maybe you, you, the one pulse valve that could do th- multiple coils. <laughs> maybe we could. <laughs> Do the whole the whole lineup with one 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 uh with one valve. <laughs> we'll, just, we'll just we'll rip out we'll rip out the 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 you know the other two pulse valves, and we'll just you know feed it into one distributor and just let it let it feed to all the fucking coils. We're actually uh, th- tomorrow they're resizing all the orifices at the store. We did to Come one on. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yeah. Enjoy losing product because that that's what's going to happen. And then not even two weeks later, they lost all the product. Because it took out the rack again? Took out the yep. oil system? Yep. Yep. Didn't, hey, we figure, it, didn't we figure that out like two months ago? Three months ago. Oh, was two it? Really? Three yeah. months. <laughs> but, I mean, it is what it is at that point. Like, I mean, it's just, you know, you, you can only say what you could say and, uh, you got all these, you know, engineers f- pointing fingers at each other, and it's just like, mm, just let them let them duke it out. I, I just, I just put it together. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Yeah, but let's go over on how to verify this stuff, guys. So, I will tell you this: case controllers. I mean, you're going to have lag. I mean, depending on what your system is, unless you're like, like an Aldi where it's tiny and you don't have that many case controllers, you're going to have lag. So when you're checking sensors and stuff on the E2, especially on the E2 or like other stuff, you're going to have a little bit of lag. So just, you know, give it a little bit of leeway as you're checking stuff. Don't just, you know, instantly think it's going to populate and, uh, you know, you're going to spray something with duster or something. It's instantly going to come down. Give it, give it a little bit of like time with lag. Same thing with like checking transistors. If you could do it at the case controller and it has a display, that's great. That's the best way to do it. Now, you're going to have to do it on the on the uh, the main controller somehow, but there's going to be lag. So just just bear with it. I mean, checking transducers, just kind of let them average out. Go ahead, Brett. Would you Would you rather? Um, I mean, this is what I would do. I mean, I basically would shut off the just shut off the the the, the liquid and just let it sit at whatever the suction pressure is. Yeah, no, that that's that's so when I check transducers, when I check their accuracy, I do it during the initial pressure test. No, I no, I understand that, and that makes total sense because then you can it's a controlled factor. But what I'm saying is like 90% of the time, the service guys that are listening here are gonna be checking it after you know someone has left the building and basically they're they're left to deal with whatever the fuck they're dealing with. And you know, I would rather shut off a suction. And let it build up pressure just for the simple fact that I want to see it without the you know variable change the, the suction pressure changing up and down. I want to see it steady. 
So if you shut you shut the suction, you're going to be steady 100%. If you shut the liquid, you're still going to be you're still going to be fluctuating with the compressors. Well, how about how about with the CO2 though? Because the 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 pressure you know changes so drastically with the temperature. Yeah, huh? Maybe everything checks back to the liquid. True. So I mean, you don't have to worry about that. It all checks back. So don't worry about shutting it off. Just just I shut off the suction, and then I let it build up. You know where it equalizes. And then that way I have a solid static number I could check it against. Yeah. So essentially oh. you're checking it out. It'll basically end up being off the, the flash tank pressure at that point. Close to it. Yeah, close to it. Yeah. Um, so as you're doing that, like I, I like to do like that. If you could get on the case controller, like I know on the core links, you could see certain inputs from the, the display when it works. Um, if you could see, if you could see those, that's great. The Dixels, if you have a display, you could see the uh, suction pressure. So, if you if you need to track it and instead of like trying to like run all the way back to the E2, you on the Dixel stuff, you have, if you have the display there, you could check it. See, that's one the one real nice thing about CoreLink: the fact that you can either a hook it right up to your laptop or you know hook it up to your phone. Yeah, if you're carrying around a giant Ethernet dongle in your pocket, like. I have it in my bag. Yeah, like every service guy doesn't have. They usually leave them at the stores. Yeah, yeah, for the first service guy to take. <laughs> don't don't act like that shit ain't getting stolen. The fucking first time somebody's using it. And then it's then it's the uh who's seen it last? I don't know. I I I, I it was there when I last time I was there. Why they're only what the, I think they charge, uh, I think they charge like 300 and 350 bucks. Sure. You can for $25. Uh, uh listen, I'm not, I'm not gonna argue with it. All I'm saying is, is that that's that's what I think it's like 300 bucks when you when you buy it from the manufacturer. Um, uh, <laughs> you can build it, you know what I mean? And I had directions a long time ago, basically, how to set it it's up. It's literally a $20 Amazon router with a with a USB to eat, Ethernet. Ethernet. Yep. that's it. Well, don't forget, you need the one USB to two USB so you can power up the actual dongle, which is an additional $10. Yeah. <laughs> and then the case and the sticker. You need the sticker. The sticker with the password that doesn't work anymore. <laughs> that's <what> kills me. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, obviously that that's a little easier to check. Uh, microthermal is nice because you could just you know get on your like computer and or phone on team viewer and just look at it that way so i mean th those case controllers they don't have case displays obviously but like those ones i never have usually update issues so they usually update pretty quick yeah now rdm i i've never really messed with can you see their uh, displays from I yeah, you know, so you can actually look through all the all the inputs. Uh, typically, you have to press. Oh, I can't pick. Okay, I think it's the enter button because it's the top left button and the bottom button. You hold it, and then you, as long as you know what you're looking through, um, you know, there's there's a parameter for for inputs, outputs, and then um, it's been a minute, but there's the you know you can look it through the through the, like the percentage of the actual valve, like you know what the what the percentage is on the pulse pulse width valve. Uh, it's, it's, it's fairly easy and it's, it, you know, you're looking right at the controller, like 99, I think almost all of them actually come with the display. Yeah. Like they have their own display in the RDM. I can't I think, think of pretty much nothing. every case controller you can see from displays, except for microthermal, which they just don't have a display. See, and that's the other thing. So, I mean, and it's probably cause it's basically the same company, but you know, the S3C same thing. I mean, you can see it fucking right away. You know, but it's it, the 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 app. I I love. I don't know. Well, the I SC like, the SC three is like it is nice. Like that that part of it is nice. No no carrying around a stupid dongle to go like from anything. They just need to get rid of the password. Yes, they need to just get rid of the password. Absolutely, it it like it like handy it kneecaps that whole controller. Yeah, that, well, that's that's the only thing. It, like it's not that the the controller is not accessible. It's just. Try, trying to get someone available uh, that that can have the password you know what i mean whether it be 
from from the manu from the manufacturer uh you know to the contractor or to the uh you know from the customer like have at least let have them have a fucking list of the the passwords unless it's you know rando like the uh like the like the e2 is now with the with the upgraded firmware somebody's gonna crack that one day <laughs> be brass monkey too <laughs> <laughs> so bad um but yeah like uh, verifying all the rest of the stuff you know it, it's you know just it's better to have a stagnant uh temperature and or pressure in order to verify this stuff um make sure that you're, you're having the the proper temperature sensors uh making sure that the correct range uh one of these things that, that you'll see is you know you have the the dixel controllers that are that basically come from united um that come in a package uh that are like hey you know once and does everything and i had one of those uh, have a sensor go bad. It just opened up, uh, caused the case temperature to, to, to shut down or whatever. And someone told me to put a CPC sensor in and you, you have to watch because you know, the regular CPC sensor is their 10 K type three. I keep forgetting two, it's a 10 K type two. Sorry. So, um, and then yeah, 10 K type two. And then you have the uh, the black sensor, which goes to that controller, which is a 10 K type three. So it, it, it's still 10,000 ohms at 77 degrees, but as the temperature starts coming down, the, the, the range widens at the lower end, like towards when it's trying to maintain temperature by anywhere from six to eight degrees, just, you know, how the resistance works on the, on the lower end of the, of the, of the glide. And so making sure that you actually have, the correct temperature sensor in there and that you know sometimes you'll get uh cases that have you know like aftermarket style temperature sensors and because anyone can make a temperature sensor i mean i you know i, I saw squires the one day he was sent he sent me a picture of uh you know uh, rtd that that he got he's like yeah these are the same thing as microthermal and, and it was basically like a solder on you could solder the freaking the thing onto the wires and and so you just have to watch the ranges of what of what you're putting in there and what's actually in there and verifying that it's that it is the actual correct correct sensor. Yeah, and then when you guys are checking sensors, so when I'm going to like check them, make sure they're in like the right spots or like if it's like three coils in one case and all three have a, a temp sensor in the outlet, I'm not gonna sit there and like try to warm up each one. I'm going to hit them all with like duster one by one duster upside down, spray the first one, see if it gets cold. If the right one gets cold, move on to the next one, spray the next one. You know, that way I, I go one by one. I'm not going to sit there and try to, this temp sensor is 36.7 degrees. Well, it's reading 36.9. Or maybe it's this sensor. I'm not going to waste my time doing that. I'm going to spray them. With Hello guys. This episode is brought to you by field peace. The tough wireless vacuum gauge MG44 from Fieldpiece is engineered to give you the reliable reading you need and the ease that you want. Confidently measure vacuums with a reliable leak-proof seal. The MG44 can be used with the JobLink system app from up to a thousand feet away. This easy to read backlit LCD offers a graphical representation of the vacuum progress even in low light or at odd angles. Visit www.fieldpeace.com for information or follow us on social media at Fieldpeace Products. Thanks again and enjoy the episode. Hey guys, today's episode is sponsored by Westermeyer Industries Serviceable Oil Floats. Many oil separators contain an oil float to effectively meter separated oil back to the compressors. Westermeyer Industries has taken this concept and perfected it. With their new line of serviceable oil floats. These floats feature an improved design with fewer components, allowing for greater manufacturer consistency and up to 20% increased oil flow versus their legacy models. These floats also feature an integrated magnet to shield the oil path from debris and have been field proven in supermarket applications. Westmeyer Industries offer replacement oil floats not only for their own separators but also cross compatible models for our competitor oil separators as well you can find out more about the westermeyer industry serviceable oil floats by visiting westermeyerind.com backslash floats once again that's westermeyerind 
dot com slash float. Let's get on with the episode. Buster. Okay. And then once I know the sensors are in the right spot and I have the right sensor on the right input, then I will check its accuracy. I'll throw a clamp next to it. Go ahead, Brett. What's the temperature that when you hit it with the duster? Because I was I was actually t- telling someone about the day. It'll go like that, like minus like thirty. Well, that's what I said to him. I was like, man, I think it's like minus twenty or something like that. You know, because you know the duster, whatever's in there, depends it, on what sauce you give it. Oh, really? Yeah, I mean, if you just give it like a a quick spray, it may shoot down to like thirty degrees. I mean, if you give her the full sauce, I mean, <laughs> she may go down to like minus thirty <laughs> and shut down. You know what? It's probably I guarantee it's probably probably an actual uh, you know refrigerant like one thirty four A or something. It was actually funny. I saw. Uh, did you see someone put up? It was an inhaler, and in the in the uh, ingredients in the inhaler, it actually had one one thirty four A as the propellant. I mean, it, I'm sure it probably is. It's it's probably some refrigerant because <laughs> it gets hella cold. <laughs> I mean, and like sometimes it likes it, like it'll it'll lag a little bit, like so. Like when we're checking, even like the Dixel stuff, like even on like a smaller store, it lags for a second. Like you got to spray it, and like it isn't like an instant like shoot down. I mean, it's gonna take a second for the temp sensor to react, and I mean, it has to you know reduce that the ohms in there and the voltage, so or you know increase it depending on which way it is. So it, it's going to take a second, but like I mean, it'll. It'll sit there, been like it'll stay cold for a while. Well, yeah, you're getting all the way down to negative thirty. I guess it will, right? Yeah. So I mean that that's like my my way of doing it. Like I love using the duster. It's cheap. Like I could buy an entire case from Costco for like twenty bucks. <laughs> oh, you know of, of the can jumbo. You, can you please reconcile this box of duster? What are you using it for? Uh, I'll get it. I'll get it taken care of. We have a funny story about that, not the duster, <laughs> but like uh, whippets. So we were we were uh, changing how to walk in, and at the store, and we you know, we pulled the coils down, and nobody got on top of the box yet. Well, they went to go start pulling the, the box apart, and all of a sudden they pull like two panels, and like hundreds of whippet cans whipped cream cans come like fucking caving in the box but apparently like all the store employees like the night stalkers were just doing whippets back there and they were just tossing them on top of the walk-in when they were when they were done i mean there had to have been 400 cans so <laughs> it's just so there was it was between the wall and the walk-in so when you guys took the walk-in down it, it, it was on the roof the roof of the ceiling of the walk-in oh shit no one just ever went up there Nobody ever went up there, and it was like it was real. It was like maybe like three feet to the bar joist. So like the carpenters were pulling the panels from the sides, and nobody ever looked up there to see what was on top there. Like it just they started pulling the box apart, and there was just hundreds of whippet cans. <laughs> Someone really likes whipped cream. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but back to the case controller guys. Uh, and then <laughs> stop it. <laughs> But verifying like temp sensors, like obviously make sure the pipe's clean and then check it with like a like a Cooper or something that's going to have a good contact like a go ahead, Brett. So, I man, I have a question. So what is what is your protocol? So, like, I mean, you know, we all know that Sporlin and Dan Foss and everyone else will tell you to wrap the TXV bulb in the uh, in the case. Um, Yeah, there's billions unwrapped i i know that i know that so um wrapping the temperature sensor for the suction thoughts i think it should be done because it, it, I think it should, know. but like i'm not gonna go out of my way to do it why not because if if the case manufacturer wanted it done they would have done it because they know what a they're lot doing. Of them do, though. That's what I'm saying. So a lot, a lot of the ones that I have been seeing, you know, have have them wrapped. Whether they stay wrapped during the shipping process, that's another story. Now, I will say this: it matters what you wrap them in. Don't wrap them in that thumb gum shit. Don't be a prick. <laughs> no one likes the guy with the thumb gum or well, the cork, you know, tape. cork tape. Yeah, the, cork, cork, tape. Tape. Like cork tape shit, like like that stuff, like it. It, it ruins the sensors. 
Does it really? Yeah. So like the cheap ass sensors that Hill buys or wherever they're buying them from wish.com. Uh, <laughs> like they, they literally just like pull right off. off. They, they get stuck in there. The wish.com sensors the Hill buys. <laughs> You're making my job so much more harder. <laughs> it's such a trip. <laughs> That was a good one, was it not? You're such a cock. <laughs> uh, guarantee I'm going to edit this bitch when I'm tired and I'm going to miss that comment. <laughs> but I'm going to get full <laughs> Whatever. Wish.com sensors. Whoever the fucking manufacturer is that's buying their sensors from Wish.com, they need to knock that shit off. <laughs> They, they they are They're like the cheapest sensors ever, but like the 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 actual cork tape is. Are they is, the ones? Are they the ones that are like yes. like not even a half inch and they're yes. square all the way around? <laughs> we get eighty percent fail rate, and they're always on the suction line, and uh, they just take out compressors. It's nothing more compressors. So, yeah. I mean, th- I would watch it with that. Like, I'll use, like, the insulation tape, or I'll use a piece of, like, 3 8 RMO to zip tie it mm-hmm. on there. That, that That's what I'll use. I'll, but, the like, the cork tape stuff just messes up everything. And it's a pain to get off. Yeah. Yeah, and then you never but, but, get, then you have to end up cleaning the shit off with, you know, some kind of degreaser just to get the thing clean so you get a good contact with the new replacement non-wish.com sensor correct now what i've been using for like verifying them is uh either my cooper uh a field piece pro or a field a, a testo probe and a uh sporlin probe this the sporlin probes uh generally my go-to it's usually in my bag so but i mean you you Generally, have to insulate that one to get a real good like contact. If you if you're checking sensors against it, yeah, and that goes so, the same, and that goes the same thing with defrost termination sensors. Um, you know, uh, making sure that you're using zip ties, especially with hot gas. Um, I don't know because <laughs> you can tell typically when when you know you have the rack either where the rack liquid level goes up to 100 percent if you have an OLDR on the outlet of the of the uh, the receiver or the the rack will go off on high pressure because the, uh, the pressure transducers um, I'm sorry that the deep frost termination sensors that were supposed to be on the dump line are no longer on the dump line. You can see them, you know, basically the temperature will start rising. Then it'll get up to like 32 degrees and it'll just fucking hang there because the case just ends up just hanging out at that temperature because everything that's frozen in that case. And then you can say, Oh yeah, you know, the, the looks like the temperature sensors off the actual pipe. And you go down there and find a boatload off because they use that thumb gum and freaking just heated up the thumb gum and fell off. And the wish.com sensor fell in the. uh... No, these aren't wish.com ones. Oh, so I switched to using metal zip ties. When you say metal zip ties, are you talking about zip ties? So not the plastic ones that have metal inside. Correct. I use I switched to using on sensor stuff. I I switched to using stainless zip ties. Really? And then I have like a little gun for it, and like that's how you tighten it. That way they don't come loose anymore. What's your boss? So say? I, you know. What's that? I said, "What's your boss say about the PNL? You wasting all those stainless steel zip ties?" Well, I don't give a shit. They get built out in jobs. Well, I'm saying, are they, are they that more that much more expensive? Oh. They got they got hundred packs like eight dollars. Oh, okay, not that bad. So they're 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 honestly not, and like it it looks so much cleaner too. Like when you're especially like rack stuff or like your like mountain sensors on a rack. Like I use stainless zip ties instead of using like a band, hose clamp or like zip ties. I've been using the stainless ones. Like they, they're they they literally just clamp down. And like there's like a little metal like banding tool almost. Like mm-hmm. you literally just. Uh, pinch it and uh it tightens it and like lobs it off at the same time i just use so bread I, ties. yeah well certain customers won't won't allow that and then you end up getting a punch stupid punch list so if you, 
Red ties? If you use anything, well, one particular customer, if you use anything besides stainless zip ties, uh, they make you go through and redo them all. So I just started using them for everything. So I don't know. It, it, it's it's a lot easier, and then like you don't have to worry about them coming loose or uh, plastic zip ties because certain zip ties, like I go through a shit ton of zip ties because I use those spoiler probes and other stuff. Like the the spoiler probes, you got to zip tie them. So like I use a shit ton of zip ties. It matters where you buy zip ties. Like if you buy zip ties at Menards, good fucking luck. They're gonna break in low temp. As soon as they get cold, they're gonna snap. Like the Greeley ones are the only ones that I found that like actually make it like in low temp and stay and well, don't get. That's because they got the metal in there. Like down, down, the, down, down. Yeah. Like next time you cut a, cut a zip tie, um, you know, like one of the big, you know, uh, uh, you know, electrical style ones. If you look, typically you'll have two pieces of really, really, really teeny tiny wire down both tracks. And that's, that's what's preventing it from, you know, the expansion and contraction. Yeah, because like some of them, like if you get like the the commercial electric ones, they mm-hmm. those those fucking things just snap. Like you mm-hmm. literally you'll go to you go to tighten them and they just snap right off and like being in, in there for a few seconds, like they get that brittle. So like I mean it really matters what zip ties you use. So then all right, guys, uh, next thing is checking like the discharge air sensors, making sure they're in the right spots. Cause I've seen a ton of these case controllers either get mixed around. Like meaning like discharge air temp one is in three or two. I mean, it's a lot easier to verify that part because it's usually, you know, up on top of the top of the box, the canopy and your case controller is pretty, you know, right there. So you either spray it or you could just, you know, pull on the wires and figure out where they're going. But I mean, make sure they're in the right spots. I mean, I've seen guys waste countless amounts of time, you know, with sensors in the wrong spots or they're in like the, the channel in like the Hussman cases, there's like a, a dead channel and it like it, it's warm air. So it's radiating warm air. So you're not making temp and guys are, you know, messing around with like PIDs and fan motors and everything else. And then the, the sensors aren't even in the airstream. So, uh, Greggy, um, call, uh, I think it was either Greggy or Schrodinger. They called me up and, and was saying, Brett, my, my fucking probe is like reading 10 degrees off from what the EMS is. And the EMS is even wrong. I'm like, doesn't sound right. So I, I was there checking checking the case temperatures, and I jammed the probe up in one side, and I jammed the probe in the other side, and I I didn't put them at the same exact spot, you know, because I'm, I'm thinking, okay, the honeycomb is four inches wide. It's just going to be the same fucking air. And sure as shit, I'm like, well, why is my shit reading off 10 degrees? This one's reading right, and they told me that this one was reading wrong, and it was because that dead spot in that case. I don't... I, I haven't talked to Husband yet. I haven't figured out why that area is there. Um, it's a why channel the- to keep it from sweating. Mm. It's like a uh, there's like a false through the whole case. There's like a false uh, like channel to keep air from moving inside the case to keep it from uh, sweating. So like it, it off a of convection, it makes like a. An um, air barrier, probably. Yes, it's like an air barrier. The air is air is an insulator, right? So, I'm, so I'm pretty yeah. sure, like the whole thought process behind it is the as the air is coming out, it acts like a venturi and pulls that other air. Okay, I see. Where you, I see. Where, I see where you're going. I was. I'm sorry. I was thinking. Yeah. So I'm I mean, like, how like, is it like a venturi? But like, I see what you mean. Like, as the cold air goes up above, it's it's basically you know creating more of a barrier. I understand. Yeah. What you're saying. So, but like, make sure you push those sensors. So what I do with them, like, if when they're putting the cases together, if I can get to them, I'll lob the sensor back a little bit. Like, I'll pull a little bit of extra wire out, and I'll you know push it back more towards the. Uh, yeah, you know what? You have to be careful though, because it, you, you don't want to have the the case temperature sensor actually like touching the metal. Mm. That's the only, nah, man, that's the only thing you you don't you know because it you know you're sensing air temperature, so that's the bitch. Like you know, if you just lob it up there, I, I don't agree with you on it. So like, if if you just lob it up there, you're basically getting um you know the the, the, the actual you know metal metal temperature you know what i mean so like on those particular cases what i was doing was is just basically taking the 
going as close to close to the the, the back end of the case as possible because the, the the dead spot was more towards the front right so i would put it up in and then just have the sensor sticking up through the honeycomb probably about half inch to three quarter of an inch so it's still the tip is still getting all that cold air coming out the coming out the top flu panel i mean that works or you know or if you have the option you know on, on some of the hill phoenix and the tyler shit where you have the uh the, uh, that spot in there that's why those those uh those they always have that that screw in there with the with the nut on there to basically push it off there so it's not ever touching the actual metal if you talk to harry he'll tell you and he'll yell at you if it's touching the metal I mean, as long as it's not in the dead zone, it's good. <laughs> cold is cold. <laughs> I mean, the first time somebody from the store goes to clean the honeycombs or rips out the fucking sensor, it's all jacked up anyway. <laughs> Don't act like it isn't true. <laughs> Never happened. Yeah, or or the, the first PM guy that or kid that's sliding set the honeycombs down is ripping all the sensors out. That never happens. Yeah. Ever. Yeah. So, like, which, when I'm checking discharge air, guys, like, I generally use, like, a field piece, like, like a little field piece stab probe or a Cooper Atkins little stab probe. That's what I check those with. I just verify those with, uh, yeah, I just jab it up in there, and, uh, you know, then I, then I leave it there and forget about it, and then I have to buy another $27 thermometer. I'll probably go through about 15 a year. See, I, that's why that's why I have the big red box, and then basically that probe isn't going anywhere unless the big red box goes anywhere with me. Well, the nice thing about those big the Cooper boxes, the big red boxes, is you could make your own sensors. You hear that? Yeah. What the hell is that? I think it might be a tornado siren. No, it's okay. You're good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you saw that fucking picture I said you right? Yeah. So you can make with the Coopers, you can make your own sensors. All they are is CPC sensors. You know what I, I saw that on someone's uh they had a they had some kind of probe, you know, break break off there. And I was like, I saw a CPC sensor wired to it. And I'm like, what the fuck? You know, what what's up with that? He's like, Yeah, the probe went bad. I, you know, some you know, I guess he had it. He was testing something and like something burned through the wire or whatever and burnt off the tip of the probe. So he's like, yeah, I just threw on a CPC sensor. It's working fine. I, I, I've i actually, like before I had like all my like probes and stuff, I had my Cooper Red Box and I had four CPC sensors with 20 foot leads on them. So that's why I used to set superheats. I would, I would, I would strap the sensors to the suction lines and then I would, uh, I would use, I would use the Cooper Red Box. So, I mean, I, I had all, all the sensors on there, and I had a couple, like, walk-in probes, same thing. I would have those ones so I could, you know, do, like, long temp probes. It worked great. I mean, but, I mean, that thing's, like, 200 years old, so. And I, I prefer everything digital, like, like actual, like, on my iPad, so I could just verify it, everything. <laughs> Why are you digging on bad, te- on old on older technology? I love that's, my that's, Cooper Redbox. Like, old as you fuck you i don't care i fucking love it old battery still it has what it has a nine volt battery still so what like it, it's old okay like it, it's very very limited so is your haircut <laughs> fuck you <laughs> All right, let's this. Uh, All right, thanks for listening all right, guys. Later. Are you, you going to die? <laughs>